From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. It's another name in the ring in the race for governor, but not in the way many expected. Former Republican lawmaker Joe Trillo announces his candidacy, but as an independent. For now, leaving two Republicans to battle it out in the GOP primary, Cranston Mayor Alan Fung and House Minority Leader Patricia Morgan. This week, what Morgan thinks of the new wrinkle in the race and how she plans to stand out on a ballot that feels like it's getting more crowded by the minute. Our guest on Newsmakers, Republican candidate for governor, Patricia Morgan. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program from WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Leader Morgan, good to have you back on the program. Thank you for having me. Why do you want to be governor? Because I think our state's going in the wrong direction, and I think I I have solutions that will make the lives of Rhode Islanders better. All right, and we'll dive into some of that and some policy. But first, I do want to get you to weigh in on the uh, Joe Trillo announcement uh, that he's running as an independent. Did that take you by surprise? It did. Um, (laughs) Yes, it did. (laughs) Did he call you? Were you aware this was coming? Had you gotten whispers about it? He did call me, but he didn't tell me that he was going to do it the next day. Um, You know, we each have to run our own race. And in my, my opinion, it's the people of Rhode Island who are going to make the decision about who they want leading this state. I'm going to make my case to the people of Rhode Island. And um, I think I have a really strong message, a message that will attract them. I, I expect that I will prevail. So you've, uh, I'm sure, heard it, the school of thought that having uh, at least three, three candidates on the ballot in the general election uh, helps Governor Raimondo win re-election. What do you say to that? I think that I, there's some wisdom to that because there's so many Rhode Islanders who will just vote party line. Um, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for every vote. I'm going to go into Providence. I'm going to go everywhere in Rhode Island, making my case to, to the people who will be voting. Um, and you know, I'll answer all their questions. You know, I do, and I will make sure that they know what I stand for. And so I think I stand been, for a brighter future. It would have been easier, is what you're saying, for you or Alan Fung, whoever the Republican nominee is, if Joe Trillo uh, wasn't running as a third-party candidate or an independent. I think I it complicates say. it for us. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain base vote, a base Democrat, base Republican vote. The de- the base. Uh, Democrat vote is larger. So I think it does com- uh, complicate it. That being said, I think that the governor, Governor Raimondo, has done a really poor job uh, leading our state, and I think we can get some of those Democrat votes. Um, we don't want to spend too much more time on Trillo, but one other question I wanted to ask you about, um, as he was discussing why he made this decision, uh, one thing he pointed to a couple times was he felt he wasn't getting a fair shake, he said, in the Republican Party, that uh, Republican leaders in Rhode Island, he felt, had sort of anointed Alan Fung the nominee, and uh, he felt he was being boxed out. Now, of course, uh, he's not the only person who wanted to be the nominee instead of Alan Fung. You do, too. Do you feel that way, that, that you're not getting uh, treated fairly because there's a... a, a you know, a prevailing sentiment that it's going to be Alan Fung again for the nomination? No, I go to, I'm going to the, all the Republican events. I'm, I'm being given the floor. People are talking to me, so I don't see that. Mm. You're facing Alan Fung now in the primary, now that Joe Trillo is out. I, I, I'm wondering what you view as the single biggest difference between you and Alan Fung. I think the, the biggest difference, I, I've, I've been working at the state level for a long time. My focus has been on those policies that affect everyone in Rhode Island. Alan has been a mayor. He's been confined in the city, and, and I don't want to take anything away from him. He's done a good job in Cranston, but there's so much more than Cranston in Rhode Island. We have 38 other cities and towns. And I've been in the legislature now for seven years. This is going to be my eighth. I think I've championed those policies that will make the cost of living go down in Rhode Island, that will help people live better lives. Those are statewide issues. And I'm thoroughly grounded in them at this point. Do you, uh, another politics question for you. So the Fung campaign put out a poll. They haven't been saying too much about their primary opponents or one opponent at the moment. But they put out a poll putting him in the mid-40s, putting you a bit behind in the 20s. Um, Do you see him as the front runner and you're the underdog, as that poll would suggest? Or do you think those numbers aren't aren't really in line with where you think the primary is? 
You know, um, he ran before. He has greater name recognition than I do. There's no doubt about that. That was a robocall after he did a, an advertising blitz. It would, you would expect there to be a greater name recognition. Um, I've just begun. I have, uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to make my case to the people of Rhode Island. I've been a strong voice for everyday Rhode Islanders. I think I've championed the things that they care about. Um, so once they get to know me, I, I expect I'll do better. So as you point out, you've, you've been a lawmaker since 2011, and, and you are an outspoken lawmaker, and as you put it, you've been a strong voice. But what do you view as your single biggest achievement as a lawmaker? You know, um, one of the things, and I think you, know, you both know that up in the State House, is that uh, Republicans, I've put in a lot of bills, and actually about 14 of them have been passed, unfortunately not under my name. Um, so th when the Democrats see a good idea, they tend to take it, put their name on it, and pass it. So there are What's some really good things. What's an example of a bill that they stole from you? Okay, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> That's sort of how you made it sound, for sure. Um, yeah, I was the original sponsor of the bill that removed income tax from Social Security, state income tax from Social Security. That was my bill. Which Speaker Mattiello wound up getting behind and was uh, passed into law. That's right. How about a, a regret you have as a lawmaker in the past uh, seven years? Something you would like a do-over on? Oh, that's a, um, a do-over on. Well, I mean... I haven't thought in terms of that. You're going <laughs> to. It'll take me too long to think of one. I think. Um, Let me ask you a specific one. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, Governor Raimondo's first year, you were among the Republicans that passed her budget straight out, didn't vote against it, mm. uh, which then, of course, passes a lot of the initiatives and agendas that you are railing against now. Do you regret that voting for her budget? That was a really difficult vote for me. Um, the Social Security tax was in that budget. Uh, I, yeah, perhaps I wouldn't vote for that now. Yes, in hindsight, I probably wouldn't. Um, let's, uh, looking forward a bit, um, new Pawsox bill is mm -hmm. out before the Senate. You're, you're the House Republican leader, but the Senate has a bill, and then we expected we kicked over to the House to be debated uh, sometime early next year. Republicans have generally been pretty strongly against this project. Uh, the advocates for it say that, you know, there are some new taxpayer protections in here uh, related to revenue and lease, et cetera. Uh, you know, before we get into the weeds on that, let me just ask straight out, is there any scenario you could see where you could get behind building a new stadium in Pawtucket? Over the next 18 months, we're facing a $260 million deficit, budget deficit in our state budget. We don't have money for that. I mean, it's, it would be a nice thing uh, to keep the 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 Pawsock Stadium here. I think it's a private business, and at this at this point, it's incumbent upon the owners to take that on. They bought it. They should build their own building because the state doesn't have the money. We have we have to find 260 million dollars, and we've known that for a long time. That deficit has been looming out there. Every time we've passed a budget, we have been warned. This budget is growing significantly every year. We haven't made a course correction. We need to make that course correction. We need to change the bad policies that are driving those deficits. Until we do that, we don't have room for nice things like stadiums. 100% funded by the ownership. That's the only way you could see supporting a new stadium. Except for infrastructure improvements, you know, around uh, ramps and accessibility, those kinds of things. Charlie Baker, Republican governor in Massachusetts, the same job you want. Um, he's now saying he supports Worcester's efforts to lure the Paw Sox up there. Um, he might provide, he told reporters, some kind of public funding. Um, you know, he's a Republican. He's going to get behind it. I suppose, based on your answer, you might say uh, their fiscal situation is different. But, you know, how do you compare your view as a would-be Republican governor to that Republican governor on getting behind a Paw Sox deal? Well, exactly but you say Massachusetts is in such much, uh, so much better shape than Rhode Island is. Our, our state is, our economy is growing at 1%, right? The rest of the country is growing at 3%, and, and Massachusetts is, is one of those that are growing at 3% or better. We really need to do the fundamental changes here to make sure that people get good paying jobs, that our economy is growing, before we can take on the nice the nice things to have. We need to do fundamental work first. I want to um, go to the deficit you mentioned. Uh, th those numbers came out, uh, they've been coming out in recent weeks, and there was an update at the House Finance Committee the other night. 
uh, going through it. Uh, you know, you mentioned we've got to get rid of bad policies, but you know, so often I see up there, everyone says they hate the deficit, but then when you get to specifics, it can be hard to find things that people will actually pass and get behind. What are some specifics you would propose to close the $60 million deficit this year and then $200 million we're looking at next year? Yeah, you know, our caucus has actually put in bills to try to start, start that process. We've looked at things like disability pension reform. That's driving property taxes. Uh, you, you, your station has done some, some exposés on the abuses that exist in the disability pensions. That's just one little one. There's things in our legal system like joint and several liability reform. 48 other or 38 other states have done this reform already. We can't get behind it. We need to do those things because one of the reasons that we have that deficit is we're not getting revenue in. And what we're not getting revenue in from is businesses and corporations. They're simply not thriving here in Rhode Island. When companies are thriving, when we're not laying uh, bad policies and regulations on them, they hire people, they give them raises, we get better income tax, sales tax revenue into the state. Um, most of the overspending in this year's budget appears is in social services, uh, DCYF, mm -hmm. developmental disabilities, and uh, Republicans, I remember when the budget uh, debate was happening earlier, a Republican lawmaker was on here and suggested those pro programs should not be cut. Um, what's your view on, on those programs in the social services area where the spending problems come up year after year? Do we need to pare back those programs? I don't know if it's paring back the programs or, or providing them more efficiently, making sure that the waste and the, the fraud that's there is waste and fraud in those programs we've seen it before it's been exposed before it still exists um, this whole UHIP um, disaster has actually I think ac exacerbated that and probably hidden some of the cost we know that there are people who have been denied benefits who needed to get them and will be uh, deemed eligible so I think it's a growing problem um, there have been studies where we've done data mining studies and found uh, food stamp abuse, abuse in the Medicaid area, people getting it that shouldn't. Um, there's a lot of things we can do. People who are in need need those programs, but we can do a better job get, giving them those, those services. Before we go to break, um, you brought up UHIP, so uh, Representative Serpa has suggested uh, just shutting UHIP down, moving on from Deloitte, and starting all over again uh, as, a, as a possible solution. If you were to become governor, what would you do? Would you do that? Would you take that approach, sort of scorched earth, drop Deloitte and start all over again? Or would you try and move forward with Deloitte and fix what we, uh, what we have in place now? See, I, think, I don't think we can just scrap it. It's $500 million, half a billion dollar investment from us in the federal government. Um, Nobody's watching Deloitte, and I think that's the problem here. There are firms out there called IV&V firms, uh, independent validation and verification firms, and they actually bring the expertise, the technological expertise, to watch Deloitte. Nobody's watching them right now. Nobody in state government has the expertise to do that. So I think we need to get a firm in like that who will tell us, and watch Deloitte and make Deloitte accountable. So it's kind of the watchdog or the oversight that's been missing on Deloitte from the very beginning. I think just I think I'd have to check. There is an IV and V contract in UHIP. Are you? But you're saying that whoever has it now is uh, not independent. Hmm. All right, uh, we're going to take a break here on Newsmakers. Our guest has two titles. She's House Minority Leader and Republican Gubernatorial Candidate Patricia Morgan. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Republican candidate for governor Patricia Morgan. She's also the House Minority Leader. Uh, leader. Uh, leader, I want to uh, talk to you about the Me Too movement, um, specifically in Alabama. Do you think uh, U.S. Senate candidate Roy Moore should have dropped out of the race? What do you fall on that? I do. You do? Yeah. What about, the, what about our current president? Uh, there's uh, a dozen or so on the record allegations of sexual misconduct against him. He was famously caught on tape uh, bragging about uh, committing sexual assault. What about him? Should he step down? Uh, no, I'm not going to suggest that at all. Well, um, then what's the difference between Roy Moore and uh, Donald Trump? Uh, a lot of people are making that argument. 
I know they are. Listen, I, I mean, I'm just talking as a mother um, with Roy Moore. A, an older man like that should not be dating younger women. I just think that's creepy, to be honest with you. Um, I'm, uh, I think he could have pulled aside somebody else, another Republican, could have qualified to run in that race, and the people of the, of the state could have chosen then. There was time to do that. Um, the people of the United States have already spoken on President Trump. The, the news was out there ahead of time. They made their, their choice. There was, a, there was an election, and he was chosen. Do you, um, do you feel, uh, you've, you've been a woman in politics for years now, you've been at the State House, you're one of the most uh, visible ones. Um, I think you've said already in the past, you haven't experienced the kind of sexual harassment that, for example, Representative Tansy has talked about. But do you no. feel you've ever been treated differently or had to uh, work harder because you were a woman uh, to get ahead in politics? Just what, what's your view as someone who's, who's made it to the, the point that you have? Yeah, I think we do have to work harder. You know, I'm also a financial advisor. And um, it's, it, it was, continues to be, I think, a male-dominated field. Uh, one of the reasons that I was recruited, quite frankly, was because there was a scandal inside Smith Barney and they were looking for females to come in and, and, and get involved in the, in the profession. If you have to work harder, you have to work harder. That's okay. You know, when I, I'm actually of the generation, we were the generation that actually burned the bra and said that, <laughs> that women had a right to take on those professions that were male dominated, that we had brains and we had ability. So kind of I feel like I'm a trailblazer in that. And and all of the all of the women are benefiting from what I have done and the women that followed me done. So eventually women will be equals in the workplace, will be equals everywhere. If we have to work harder now, it's okay. As a candidate for uh, governor now, uh, we like to do this with a lot of our candidates um, and do a quick rapid fire section on some issues that people might be interested in, but we don't want to spend a lot of time on. So I'm, I'm looking uh, generally for one word answer here. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Patricia Morgan, are you uh, pro-choice or pro-life? I am pro-life. Uh, do you support the legalization of marijuana here in Rhode Island? Not right now. I've, I've actually uh, gone to Colorado to ask them what their the pros and cons were, and they actually suggested, just wait, let us work out the bugs first. Um, should there be term limits uh, for members of the General Assembly? I do believe so. How long? I think 10 years is probably uh, the right amount of time. So five terms, 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, should the JNC have authority um, over magistrate appointments? Right now they don't, should they? Over magistrates, absolutely. Okay. Ted? Um, I want to ask you about, uh, we alluded to it, but the incentive programs, the Commerce Corporation, that whole rigmarole. Um, we did just have the announcement that Infosys, the Indian company, uh, says they're going to add, build an office with 500 jobs in Rhode Island. As part of that, the state's agreeing to give them roughly $10 million in incentives. And uh, it was noted at the time that uh, similar deals were struck in North Carolina and Indiana. They also got millions of dollars um, to, for, for the jobs in those states. And folks say, look, that's, that's what Rhode Island, well, that's why Rhode Island has to do this. We don't like it, but you know, the other states are doing it and Rhode Island has to do it too. You've been outspoken against those incentives. What do you say to that? When the, when the comparison with other states is made? Yeah, listen, there is a place for the corporate welfare, as I call it. There is a place for it. There's no doubt about it. I just think it's been done poorly in Rhode Island. And I also think that we wouldn't have to be so aggressive at giving money out to companies if we fixed some of the fundamental problems. Um, this, right, we've, over the last many decades, we've passed so many impediments to small businesses here that that it's hard to attract businesses in here without giving them money. I think we need to do that first to change all those bad policies. When we do that, we also help our homegrown small businesses. And they are really important partners in Rhode Island. They provide over half of the jobs in Rhode Island. If we, if we change those really bad policies, start taking the weights off of their backs, we're going to find we have to give less to outside companies coming in because our inside companies will be growing. So if you're elected governor, uh, you'll have to put that first budget in with your proposals of how to restructure things. Would you, it sounds like you wouldn't necessarily get rid of all the incentive programs, you might manage them differently. Would you, do you, or I should ask, would you get rid of most of them, all of them, or uh, would you keep them in place for now and try to use them differently? How would you approach it if you became governor? I think I'd change the emphasis of the Commerce Corp. Uh, we have a wonderful Quonset 
industrial park down there. It's a shining example of what can happen when you um, create an atmosphere that is easier for companies to come, grow, build. Um, I would like to see us have a, a similar Quonset, so to speak, in northern Rhode Island and maybe on the East Bay, where we, where Quonset, uh, where our Commerce Corp would actually get a, a large piece of land and manage it the same way that we do Quonset. I think that's a really, I, I talk to small businessmen from Rhode Island who are looking for uh, facilities to grow in. You know, they need more space, they can't find it. And when they go to individual municipalities, they can't get through all of the red tape and the, and the impediments that the municipalities and the state put on them. Quonset has been able to get through that and actually allow companies to come in, find a piece of land and build just like that and start growing jobs. So I would like the emphasis to be changed at Commerce Corp. Not about the giveaways, but about actually growing something of value here in Rhode Island. Leader Morgan, a, a major study found Rhode Island's public schools need uh, somewhere around $628 million in repairs just to put students out of harm's way. Mm -hmm. uh, we taped this on a Friday, and just last night, a task force studying this issue put out um, a proposal that the state borrow $500 million through 2020 for upgrades and construction. If you were to be governor... 2022, I believe. 2022, thanks. Uh, as governor, would you consider that? Absolutely. I mean, I think students and teachers deserve to live in, uh, to, to, to be in healthy schools. Uh, last year, the Republican caucus, we put in, we put in a bill to actually um, give an exemption to the prevailing wage for school repair. And that would save the state the municipalities about 15 to 20 percent of the cost of construction. Can you explain for folks at home, they might not know exactly what that rule is, how that works? Prevailing wage, think of it as the premium wage out there. Um, it, is, it is the most expensive wage and whenever there's a government project, it is now subject to prevailing wage. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we get rid of it for everything, but for school repair, because this is so important, even waiting to 2022 to get some of these, these buildings repaired is a long time. We're talking, what, five years? Um, and we could do it cheaper. So just for school repair, school repair so that kids can go to school, schools that are warm, that aren't leaking, that the windows aren't rattling in, that the toilets flush. I think that's, that's a reasonable thing to do. I, I know in Ohio they have done it. They think that they saved about 20% on the, on the cost of construction, of, of fixing their schools. So they got a lot of schools fixed very, very quickly for less money. And I think we need to look at that now. It's, it's seriously two billion if we did all of it. Even the most critical repairs, we can't wait five years for that. Um, I want to uh, pivot back to politics for a second and ask you about uh, if you were elected, you'd be the first Republican governor since Governor Kachiri, um, who was our last two term, or last Republican governor who served two terms. Let's put aside 38 Studios for a sec because it dominates the conversation these days about Governor Kachiri. When you look back at the last time we had a Republican in the governor's office, 38 aside, what did Governor Kachiri do well and what would you do differently? I think he took on the hard, the hard uh, problems in Rhode Island and tried very, very hard to solve them. But he didn't have any political experience and that was, that was his downfall, I think, a thing that, that he found the most frustration with. Because as a businessman, you just say, okay, this needs to be fixed, get the team in, get them to fix it. In politics, it doesn't necessarily work that way. You have to work through people, with people a lot more, and there is a a political dynamic to every move you make. He wasn't versed in that, so when he got in there, he was at loggerheads all the time um, with the unions and, and in, in different ways. Um, I still think that he had the right, the right answers for a lot of, a lot of things, but he, he wasn't able to accomplish them very much. Uh, the other part was not growing the party. Right, we really need a Republican. We, you were chair of the party for I was, a period of his governorship, I, was. I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we were lucky enough to grow, grow the House of Representatives to 15 while I was chairman. And with the dissidents at the time, the, I <laughs> thought of them as the right thinking, the correct thinking Democrats, we actually did do some real reforms. There were reforms in pensions and they were, there was nibbling at it at least. Uh, there was some pushback. I think he needed to spend more time actually growing the party. 
and I will do that for Republicans. Um, you need a two-party system or you get run over up there in the State House. All right, Leader Morgan, at just about 30 seconds left. Um, wondering if you will debate Alan Fung or any other Republican who might uh, throw their hat into the ring here on WPRI when the time comes. Absolutely. Yeah, you know I'm a policy wonk, so I've been up there for seven years just studying all the policies. I think I'm ready. Amped up for a debate. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Patricia Morgan, who is House Minority Leader and Republican candidate for governor, thank you very much for joining us on the program. If you missed any of it, you can catch it online, WPRI.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers.